critically analyzing global affairs. The Muckrakers on today's News Talk TNT. Well, welcome back to The Muckrakers with me, Andrew Ebon. I'm joined by Richard Pater and the usual crowd of Dr. George Samueli and also Martin Jay. And we're looking at the Middle East and trying to unpack uh, the fact from the fiction and trying to find a way uh, forward. Uh, now, US President Joe Biden, he met his uh, senior national security team uh, in a political climate where many are warning of a possible Iranian retaliatory uh, attack on Israel. Um, Richard, uh, tell me what your thoughts are on Iran. And even President Putin is sort of urging response Strength, if you like. They know there's going to be some sort of retaliation. Uh, what are your thoughts? So first of all, I'll, I'll kind of give a view from the from the ground up here in, here in Jerusalem. Is It's a very surreal time, and not just similar to where we were in April, where we see the threats, we see the, uh, we see the propaganda videos coming out of the, the Iranian regime, that's kind of pulling these heavy missiles out of, the, out of the bunkers in preparation for attack. And it's obviously, it's quite disconcerting and, uh, and disturbing for a civilian population to see this happening in, in real time. I mean, from the Israeli perspective, it's quite clear that the Iranians have their, have their tentacles all over, the, all over the region, where they are a source of uh, of harnessing further further suffering and instability that the uh, the model that uh, the the former leader of the IRGC Soleimani um his his goal was to set up a, a ring of fire surrounding Israel and as we have now we have seven fronts all of Iranian proxies targeting Israel from Hamas in the south from the Houthis in Yemen from uh, Hezbollah in, Le- in Lebanon from the uh, militias in Syria and in Iraq and from the Iran itself. So it's quite disconcerting. On the positive side, I would say that just like on April, the night of April the 14th, a coalition um, came together, including the Brits, the US and regional partners as well, and helped Israel defend itself. So one hopes that uh, when this imminent attack happens sooner sooner or later, that the international coalition is in place to, uh, to defend Israel again. Martin? Um, a lot of uh, Israeli IDF talking points there, which we need to unpack. Um, you know, it's incredible how, Richard, you've just completely left out all the important nuances of that statement. You know, I mean, Iranian-backed militias in Syria and Hezbollah in, 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 in Lebanon um, and, and, and other people, uh, f- factions in Iraq, all poised along with the Houthis to hit possibly Israel. Why? Because of the genocide in Gaza. So let's just tackle that and let's use that word. Is it a genocide? Is that how you see it in Gaza? Definitely not. No, I don't think so at all. I think that the idea, and I think, again, the, the, this agenda for the Iranians started long, be- long before October. The ring of fire that they built up, the empowering of, their, uh, of the, the proxies, particularly the most powerful ones, the Houthis and, uh, and Hezbollah, are there to threaten Israel. I think it's there, essentially the long-term game is to uh, protect the Iranians from their nuclear program. If Israel or anyone else were to attack it, Hezbollah are there as the insurance policy. So I think that's a long-standing approach that's got nothing to do with, with October. And no, and I completely, politely, um, d- respectfully disagree that there is a genocide. I think if there was any attempt at genocide, then the attempts of the Hamas infiltration to kill um, women, children, families in their homes on the 7th in the communities inside Israel was the real uh, attempt at genocide, whilst Israel, as I said before, carries out a very clear policy of distinction between armed Hamas Nicks and, uh, and a civilian population. OK, so to recap then, for you, this conflict started on October the 7th? No, of course not. No, no, no of course not. This is the, we're in a, a longer, the, 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 the conflict itself, we can trace back to the roots in the, uh, the early part of the, uh, of the of the 20th century and a rejection i think at, at its core is a rejection of of the principles of zionism that the jews are an authentic part of the region here and again if i take a, a positive swing at this question one of the most impressive aspects of the abraham accords was that for the first time you've got uh, arab leaders recognizing that the jews have an authentic role in the region and so it's not about jews and jews versus arab that's the that's a very dangerous misframing of it it should be framed as the the uh, the pragmatists and the moderates against the extremes and the extremes are represented by iran and their proxies george 
Well, I agree that it's not about uh, you know Jews and the Arabs because, of course, uh, many Jews um, around the world um, do not actually accept the principle that uh, Israel is their state and that they have any real uh, connection with Israel. This was a project um, uh, conceived by uh, Zionists by sponsorship of uh, Western governments to build a what was originally called a, a national homeland for the Jews in um, what was essentially a British uh, mandate uh, territory. Um, this was not something that was uh, embraced by most Jews in the world, and it still isn't. Most Jews in the world don't live in no. Israel. And so um, it, it's, it's quite right that this isn't about uh, Jews and Arabs. It's about Israel and the Palestinians. It's about this state that was uh, implanted here, you know, displaced the local the indigenous population, and then uh, continued to uh, wage wars against its neighbors. You could say the neighbors wage wars against this place, but okay, the neighbors never really accepted it. They never, they never accepted it. They, they always regarded this as an alien uh, implantation. And then when there were various opportunities, there were many, many opportunities um to resolve these uh this dispute you know on something that would have been um fairly good terms for israel certainly far more um generous than was originally uh envisaged you know the, the balfour declaration and the the un uh partition plan there were these very generous offers that were made to israel israel time and again rejected them you know we can go through that with you know the, you know the, in the nixon administration the william rogers plan we can talk about uh nasa's uh peace offers um, and on and on and on you know we got the camp david accords uh with the uh, jimmy carter and um and then you know with oslo and israel has repeatedly rejected them you say well why is it repeatedly because it basically <laughs> wants to create the state essentially of this greater israel and of course, it's a greater Israel. Why, why did Israel grab those territories, the West Bank and the Gaza? That was the, the two parts of the original mandatory Palestine that had, that had not been, uh, that Israel didn't occupy. And Israel wanted them. Well, they took them. And, uh, and, and obviously, the goal was to create this greater Israel because the settlement policy started almost immediately after the 1967 war contrary to all the uh, UN resolutions. And that's why it makes this uh, the, any settlement of this uh, conflict um, almost impossible unless Israel returns to something which I think would something that would I think be reasonable and accepted by its neighbors, which is the 1967 borders. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I do want to focus on, um, uh, as I say, what what I, the road to peace might couple, look like. Yes, of course, of course you can. That, that's what I was going to suggest, Richard. Is if, if you want to pick uh, on, on a couple of the points that Martin and and, and George said, and then we're going to finish on uh, uh, the road to peace. Go for it. Sure, thank you. So, I mean, I would respectfully disagree that my reading of history is uh, is quite different to yours, and in fact, it, kind of the inverse opposite. That my understanding or assessment would be that Israel, that has constantly been open to reconciliation and peace with its uh, with its Arab neighbours, and has been rebuffed. And if we take the from the 1937 Peel Commission through the, the probably the most significant, the 1947 UN plan that was rejected by the Arab partners that talked about partition of the land. In 1967, this was a defensive war that Israel fought, having come under attack. You mentioned a NASA peace plan. Um, I mean, that's, I, I would love to hear more about that because NASA, in terms of the, uh, the Israeli narrative, has only been about destroying Israel. Israel, in fact, tried to prevent the, the Jordanians getting involved in 67 and sent emissaries there only after the Jordanians um, sent mortars not far from here, actually, over the other side of the steam line. Did Israel then take over the, uh, the West Bank? Again, we then have the idea that uh, this was the settlement there came from indigenous. This was not Israeli government policy. Israel was being led by a Labour left wing government. These were these were uh, a groundswell of Jews that connected to the uh, 
the, the heartland of Israeli and Jewish civilization in the West Bank. And the challenge, to, to cut a long story short, the challenge we are all left with now, those that seek peace, is to how you find a reconciliation of two legitimate national movements, the Zionists and the, of the Jews and the Palestinians, and how you build it. And your, your solution of kind of finding 67 lines with, uh, with, with, with potential modifications, I agree, is the, is the way forward, but we're much further away from there. But I don't think it's fair to, to, to categorically blame Israel for all of that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's enough misery that both sides are to blame and bad decisions have been made. But the essence that Israel has sought to find accommodation with its Arab partners and to essentially have the uh, hand outstretched to peace in principle over many, many decades. So in, 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 a, in a nutshell, uh, Richard, would you support an immediate ceasefire? I would support a ceasefire that led to the, the return of all the hostages. I think the hostages for Israeli society is an, is an open wound. I mean, again, I think the Israeli government let down their people on October the 7th and the very kind of basis of a social contract was broken when people had their homes invaded and were taken, were either killed or taken taken captive. It is the first first order of business to return the return the captives. If the captives were returned, if they if a ceasefire involved a Hamas ceasefire and a and a repositioning of power to another to another entity, another Palestinian entity, then yes, ceasefire is great. Anything that can stop the fighting should be supported. Okay, uh, very, very interesting. Because that's uh, contrary again to what Netanyahu is saying. He's saying they basically have to be eliminated before you even have uh, the discussion. Um, I, I want to then focus on George, George. First of all, there were a couple of points that, that Richard raised, which he, he questioned uh, your summary. Do you want to come back to him on those? Well, obviously, um, the the question was, you know, we go back to the uh, UN partition plan. There's no evidence that Israel ever accepted the UN partition plan. They they knew that the uh, the Arabs would not accept it. And so they pretended that they had accepted it. They didn't accept the uh, the partition plan, and that is why they always uh, coveted the uh, those territories that um, that was occupied by Arabs after the uh, the 1948 war. Um, the 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 story of the 1967 that this was a, a, an attack on Israel is just the, nobody in Israel seriously takes that. I mean that's just absurd. I mean even even historians like Benny Morris kind of rejected. Of course it was an an act of war by Israel. Israel launched that war. Clearly Nasser was was caught by surprise. He, he didn't know what was coming. That's why he hadn't made made no preparations for that war. And the goal always was to seize those two ter pieces of territory that was part of the uh, the British uh, mandatory Palestine in order to create this uh, greater Israel. NASA made very generous offers after the 67 war, which was basically return to the status quo ante and a settlement of the refugee problem. And the settlement of the refugee problem had been an ongoing thing. There were the United Nations General Assembly resolutions demanding a settlement of the refugee problem. That, that was NASA's uh, peace plan. Um, and then, of course, yeah, all, all, all the rest of it, all, you know, which were clearly in, involved uh, Israel returning to the 67 borders. That was a simple plan. But once the issue of the, of the settlements was clearly what the, the key hindrance, and of course it was sponsored by the government. So, I mean, again, there's no point in denying that. That you know, even Israelis don't deny it. Of course, it was the government. Yes, you said it was a kind of leftish government, the of Golda Meir and and Moshe Dayan, but they were they were sponsoring, they were financing the settlement, and it was done with a view to essentially that. You know, you're going to build these settlements. You're going to integrate this within uh, Israel to the point when it simply will become impossible to break the settlements. Okay. Uh, last few minutes uh, available to us. I, I do want your sort of take on a potential uh, solution for the region. I know I appreciate it's a massive subject, uh, but Martin, if you can give me your thoughts on those. Yeah, I'm listening to Richard. I, I, I really feel strongly that the big problem we've got here is that no one trusts Israel anymore. And they, they always take the high moral ground. They always have the moral tutelage to dish out in great great quantities. But whether you talk about George's reference to 1947 or 67 war, which Israel started under what today we call false flag attacks, um, you know, or even post-2005, um, and even today, the idea of Israel um, talking peace, talking for a ceasefire, 
uh, with Hamas when you're still slaughtering so many people, so many thousands of people every day in a in a genocide. You're still killing the leaders. How do you how do you negotiate with an organisation whose leaders you're killing every single day? That doesn't seem to be very genuine. Um, it seems to be actually quite um, delusional. Actually, you know, I I, th- I don't think I don't think um, Israel has the high moral ground at all. And uh, this is part of the problem: is it's not taken seriously, and and people just simply don't trust it. And uh, some of the things which have shocked me recently, when we talk about this morality that Israel seems to um, cling to, which uh, shocks me, really does shock me. You know, we we have statements from. A government minister the other day saying that you know we could happily justify killing two million um, Gazans, um, but the rest of the world wouldn't let us. You know, when when you hear that from a government minister, and on the same day or the next day you read that the Israeli government have basically stolen twenty six million dollars of tax receipts, which are supposed to be given over to to um, to the government in, in in Gaza, and said no, we're going to take this money. And give it to the victims um, of October the seventh. You know these things are frankly disgusting. You know they're repugnant, and uh, they don't really give. They don't really shine a very favourable spotlight on Israel. And Israel is now being shunned and boycotted, and the sanctions are just unprecedented around the world. Its economy yeah. is being beaten to pulp. That you wonder really, what is the long game here for Israel? Well, what is really? How does Netanyahu get out of this? And you know, and, and and continues when the military is stretched to such extraordinary lengths. I mean, I'd really like to to hear Richard's take on all this. You know, does he really yeah. believe that Israel has a high moral ground? Well, I, I think, that, and let, let's finish on that then, because as as Richard says, not not all Israelis support Netanyahu, and once this war has finished, and hopefully will finish, um, then Netanyahu's got all sorts of questions. Uh, Thirty seconds, Richard. What is the uh, the road to peace, and what's your take on what Martin said? Well, there's a lot, a lot to unpack there, but let me just try and be, be, as, be as brief as possible. I think peace comes when both sides can reconcile the existence of the other. And as I said, the, for me, the key boundary is Palestinian acceptance that the Jews are a uh, are a, an authentic um, part of this region and that they deserve self-determination, like all the other peoples, of course, including the Palestinians. And that mutual respect and reconcili- reconciliation is the way forward. And you build that by a by a coalition of the willing, a coalition of the pragmatists. We've seen it when Israel has made peace with the Egyptians and the Jordanians, with the Abraham Accord. Prior to October, the big talk was uh, was about the Saudis, and so hopefully there is a, that alignment of the moderates to to face against the uh, the extremists is the way forward. Okay. Um, we will continue this discussion. Uh, I thought it was a very productive discussion. There's lots to unpack. Uh, R- Richard Pater, um, uh, Martin and, and uh, George, thank you both very much. I'll be back with you same time, same place tomorrow. Join us there.